This afternoon's session, um, continuing the partnership and collaboration, um, we've got uh, Anita Bakshi. Um, she's um, joining us on a live stream, and her um, talk is around understanding the American settler colonial landscape in our land, our stories. So, um, welcome to Anita, and uh, we look forward to hearing what she has to say. Great. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It's uh, really nice to see, um, at least from this perspective, a whole bunch of people sharing space uh, together in a room. Uh, very enjoyable to see that from here. Um, and thank you all for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, get my presentation um, set up over here. Um, and what I wanted to do in my talk today was to sort of give you all an orientation on the landscape in the USA in the context of, of ongoing settler colonialism. And I wanted to talk about the history of Native American land and to talk about laws and policies that influence this and then the impact that's had on Native American communities in the US today. So um, I, in the second part of my talk, focus on sharing the story of one uh, group that I've been working with uh, for the last few years in New Jersey. So I wanted to start off by first sort of talking about a myth that many Americans um, seem to hold, which is that Native Americans are beings from the past and even like a very distant past, rather than understanding them as members of living communities who have political demands. And an example that I always use to sort of talk about this is this memorial that was created a few years ago, it was built in 2003. It's called the Indian Memorial. It's built at the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Mon Monument, which is a site that before that had told the story, more the story of the white American settler and a great defeat um, against uh, the Native Americans. So they added in this, what's called the Spirit Warrior Sculpture, as a way to sort of tell the other side of the story. Um, but as Dennis King from the Oglala tribe says, they sort of glamorized it, um, it isn't us, it doesn't reflect them spiritually, and they just Hollywoodized it. So many of our current representations of Native, Native Americans sort of do this, glamorize, Hollywoodize them almost as these sort of mythical beings from the past. Um, but as Erica Doss points out in the second quote I've included here, um, land rights and key rights, land rights and civil rights are key priorities today as um, I have a, a image here of the protests against the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline on tribal lands, which has really brought that much more so to the forefront. So in order to understand the political and the cultural relationship that Native Americans have to land, we have to really look at the long history of land sovereignty in relation to US federal policies. So um, <laughs> don't read all this, I don't expect you to do that. But what I want you to do is just take a look at the range of dates here for this um, set of federal policies that I'm gonna quickly go over. A lot of Americans, including myself when I was growing up and from what I learned in school textbooks, kind of thought that the removal of Native Americans happened in the early 1800s. But it actually has been an ongoing practice and process that has you know, been happening in much more recent years. So I'm gonna quickly go over these laws and these policies to kind of give an overview of how so much land was lost. So one such act is the 1887 General Allotment Act. And this um, act authorized the survey and the division of Indian land into allotments for individuals and families, ranging from 40 to about 160 acres in size. And then there was this like excess land or so-called so surplus land, which was taken by the federal government and then sold uh, to settlers. And the result of this, by the time allotment ended in 1932, it went from 130 million, 138 million acres to only 48 million acres of Indian land. So that explains how um, big chunks of land. So what you see here is the state of South Dakota. Now there is Indian land in that state, but it's just really a small, um, a small amount in relation to what was um, originally agreed upon in treaties. And, and the same thing with Oklahoma. 
Here's um, a map. I just wanted to show you a map to give you an example to see what kind of land management and division practices were used to achieve this. So this is a map of Bennett County. It's in South, uh, South Dakota. And you see here all these allotments laid out. And they include part of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, which was soon to be opened up for free homestead settlement, um, which happened in 1910. So the text in this map is kind of one of these fold out maps. So the cover of the map um, is clear to point out this incredible home seekers opportunity that this allotment allowed. And this is sort of advertised all over the country, just posters from 1911, from 1917. This is a, a big part of this process of selling land. Um, and it was happening all over the place. So here's some maps of the Cherokee, uh, the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, and then the divisions and allotments. So what happened through this process is, and it continues to be relevant today, which is even on Indian reservations, there's much land that's not owned by Native Americans. So in some cases, they're even the minority in terms of property ownership in their own reservation land. Um, we also have what's called the Indian Schools, uh, the history of the Indian Schools. In the US, the first one was the Carlisle Industrial Indian School, which was built in the state of Pennsylvania in 1879. And these schools um, were created to sort of facilitate the forced assimilation of Native children into white American society under this belief that, quote, kill the Indian, save the man. So this was another means through which connections to the land and to specific sites and geographies, as well as languages and cultural practices um, were forcibly compromised because these schools were located far away from uh, the, the communities that the children were from. Were from. Um, and then there was a whole series of government policies in the 1950s, an era that's also known as termination. And um, there are a lot of laws. The, one of the most powerful was this law known as HCR 108. And these, um, this um, law declared essentially the intent of the United States to abrogate all treaties that it had made with Native people and to abolish federal supervision over tribes. So it called for the immediate termination of several tribes. Um, and the Public Law 280 passed or transferred jurisdiction from the federal government to state governments, giving them a lot of authority over tribal lands. So by the time this uh, policy ended in 1966, 109 legally federally recognized tribes had been terminated, um, or they had lost their um, recognition as tribes, and one more million acres of Native American land had been lost. Another policy that had a lot of impact at this time was relocation. So at this point, there was um, this act kind of encouraged Native people to leave reservations and head for the cities. They had these kind of posters and advertisements for these great jobs in the cities. And this was also building off of um, the termination policies I just mentioned, which led to the ending of federal funding for like schools and hospitals and basic services on reservations. So for relocation, the federal government paid some of the relocation expenses they provided some vocational training for those who made the move, but many people became isolated from their communities and from these sort of previous systems of support. So all of these acts and policies that I've just described were aimed at systematically dispossessing Native Americans of land and also to disrupt relationships with place and community. So let's move closer to the present day. The last thing I wanna talk about here um, is environmental justice and food justice issues, which have been really present since the early days of our nation. One such act was the extermination of like tens of millions of bison in the 1800s from about 1865 to 1883. And what you see here is a photograph of um, this giant mountain of bison skulls um, that were hunted by hunters who were paid for that. And the goal was to eliminate a primary food source and to stamp out the resistance of the Plains nations. And I use this example because I think it's a good bridge to point out that, that the compromising of food sources is not a thing of, of the past 
um, but it absolutely continues today as food sources are compromised due to environmental contamination. So in the US, we have um, something called Superfund, and this refers to land in the United States that's been contaminated by hazardous waste. It's been identified by our federal um, Environmental Protection Agency as a candidate for cleanup because it poses a risk to human health and or the environment. And this little diagram sort of talks about that process. As these contaminated sites are identified, evaluated, they're put on the national priorities list, and then decisions are made about how to um, remediate these sites. So it's part of the commitment that the federal government through the US EPA makes to cleaning up these sites. So I wanna show you this map of the US, which shows the Superfund sites all across uh, the country. And it's important to point out that at least as of 2017, that Native American communities live near approximately 600 of the about 1300 Superfund site, so that's nearly 50%. It's a little under than half, a, a little under half. Um, and so this has also led to the disruption sort of traditional practices and traditional economies of fishing, hunting, foraging, and gardening. It's really cut off access to sources of healthy food. <clears throat> so now that you see this big picture <clears throat> and sort of have an idea of this larger historical legacy, for this next part of my talk, I want to zoom in and look at the experiences of a group that I've been working with, the Ramapo Lenape Turtle Clan, based in Ringwood, New Jersey, who have been living either on or near a super fun site for several decades. And I want to talk about how they've been dealing with contamination and reclamation through a cultural restoration project. So our work together has included sort of ongoing work on this book, which you see here, which is available free of charge to educators and students, and it's already been used in some classrooms in New Jersey. Um, we have a second edition coming out soon, and many of the images that you see in this presentation are from that book. Now, normally, if we were all on Zoom, I would copy a link into the chat that would give you access to where you could um, you know, see this book and download it for free. So what I'll do is I'll email that later to the organizers in case anyone um, wants to take a look. Okay, so here's where the site is located. It's up here in the northern part of New Jersey, right on the state line with New York State. There was a nearby Ford Motor Company plant, and they dumped toxic paint sludge there in the 1960s and 70s. It was placed, it was listed as a super fun site. It's taken off the list, it's put back on, and it's still contaminated to this day. I don't wanna to say too much more about the particulars of this history right now, because after I finish talking, I wanna show you a clip from our documentary that's gonna explain this in much more detail. So I don't wanna be, be too repetitive. So instead of talking about the details, I wanna focus instead on the process the process of collaboration and how we sort of um, work together. So how does someone who teaches landscape architecture play a role in this larger issue and in this much larger discourse um, around land rights and environmental justice? I kind of want to cover that a little bit. Um, one of the ways that we try to do it, and it happens um, in the book and then in this associated um, exhibit that you see some images of today, um, on the slide. We really try to do that by relying on a lot of graphic material, um, by experimenting with different kinds of visualizations to show this information clearly because it's a very complex, uh, contested story, and there's all this like, really hard, difficult to understand um, scientific and environmental data. So we experimented to see how we could show that clearly. We translated it then to some different formats. There's an exhibit, there's the film I'm gonna show you in a little bit. And the goal here was really to think about how to communicate the impact of environmental justice issues on this community. And that really required us to think a lot about information that goes beyond these like so-called objective data sets. It opens up a lot of epistemological questions for um, researchers, right? As we have to reconsider what kind of knowledge and data to include. So it really involves taking, taking seriously community knowledge that's drawn from the lived experiences of people who've responded to this environmental crisis. 
think it's really important to consider how such information is represented and communicated. Um, community level knowledge would be really difficult to represent solely in charts and graphs. Charts and graphs, so therefore we draw from representational strategies from landscape architecture and also from the environment and humanities for thinking through new forms for presenting information and raising awareness. We do include things like archival images, photography, creative drawing and mapping work to sort of illustrate the connections between environmental systems, culture and identity. And our hope is that by visually representing traditions and cultural meanings and emotions, that this project can help people to develop understandings of deeper connections to the landscape. So we really tried to make the materials aesthetically pleasing and visually engaging, which is in contrast to the manner in which much scientific data is currently presented to audiences. So we try to do this in a, a number of different ways. So along with the exhibit, like at the opening event, we had um, a panel of speakers, so these panel discussions with the Ramapo and with their partners and allies. So here in the center, we see some images of Vivian Milligan. She's a community elder and historian. We also really wanted to make the book and the exhibit interactive. So there's some in interactive pieces in the book. And at the opening, we asked people to write about any environmental losses that they had experienced on this panel, which is now um, a permanent part of the exhibit as it you know, starts to travel again and as it goes to other places. Um, at the opening, we also ask people to share their stories and these really brilliant sketch artists that I work with um, captured, captured that and translated what they were saying into um, sketches. So we're working now on a second edition of the book. And um, here's the, the cover that we're working on. And here we really wanted to be sure to add more Ramapo voices to the volume and to feature their words and their stories. So in the current version, it's a lot of me, right? As the academic writing and explaining and things like that, but we really wanted to have a lot more in the original voice. So here's where we brought in the sketch work. Here you see the story of Vivian, who I pointed out in, the, in those earlier photos. She's a community leader, an elder and historian, and she's one of the people who originally started um, to fight and advocate for the cleanup. So we added some elements to the sketches and Photoshop and InDesign, and we added in text from the story that she, she shared. And she talked about like what she loves about her community, um, the fact that she's lived there the whole time. And it's really to em emphasize that there's more to super fun sites than just narratives of damage, that these places are also home. Um, we also share the story of Wayne Mann, another community leader who who's also been pushing for the cleanup from the very beginning, as he talked about his experiences growing up, um, talked about how the Ramapo were perceived by those outside of the community and the racism that they experienced. He describes how he got involved with a neighborhood association, the start of his activism work, sort of fighting for environmental justice, and also about how he perceived as a really magical place for childhood with these rainbow colored streams and kind of coming to the realization that that meant it was poisoned and what that meant for his community. And then finally, we also, in the second edition, try to contextualize Ringwood with larger struggles that Native American communities face on their lands and the very proactive work they do, which we arranged in this um, sort of matrix here, right? They're not being passive about these conditions that they've inherited. And then we also talk about um, the environmental deregulations in the US over the past few years that affect us all and the environment and the land that we all share. Okay, and then because we couldn't do a public event because of COVID, um, we decided to in instead film a talking circle of Ramapo elders and their partners and relations. We did this in September of 2020. So here's just some shots of the, the folks who were in the talking circle and um, some scenes of us when we were filming at, at their farm in September and our <laughs> efforts to edit this film um, uh, remotely over Zoom over the last few months. So what I'd like to do, I have my timer going here and I believe I have 
about 10 minutes and 40 seconds left. So what I'd like to do with the rest of my time is just to show you um, a clip from the film. So I'm gonna just play that here and you'll get to see a segment of it. still don't know the story. Many towns don't, they've never heard of Raywood because we were written off and the, and the story was going to be buried so deep that no one a thousand years from now would ever know. And again, we have to start the motion again. We have to start rolling all over again. Collecting more people, educating more people. It's always a struggle to to show our people, you know, the red road and the, the follow a cultural way because for our poor community in Ringwood, that's been stripped away. You know, we've lost that from the, the loss of our elders. Look around one day and there was no elders, there was no old people. And I remember when I was in the event, there was old people and there was older people. And those older people are what we lost first. I went to a powwow for the Ramapo and I met Chief, Chief Mann and I met some of the elders. And they said, you know, you guys are up there in environmental medicine. What can you do to help us? We live on a Superfund site. Our children are growing up with contamination nearby. Our adults are sick. Our lifespan is reduced. What can you do to help? Can you do something? We found out that they had a lot of environmental issues and that they had an increase in some diseases above what's natural. Lots of diabetes, lots of cardiovascular disease, lots of bronchitis, lots of hypertension. They wanted to know if their land was contaminated. So we moved on with the help of Dennis DeFries and as a citizen scientist and many other Turtle Clan members who acted as citizen scientists with us and our graduate students and went out and they collected air and they collected soil, fish samples to see whether the ponds that they were fishing in, the fish were contaminated because then they eat it. We checked the plants to see what was growing in the area because plants can concentrate chemicals and especially metals. And so we're in the process of testing that. But what we did test and what we did analyze is the soil around their local church. And the soil around their local church came up in some places with higher lead and higher arsenic. And then we tested the water inside their local church and found that there were chemicals there as well. And there was elevated lead. It 
it's important to know that more than 70% of all Native Americans throughout the country live three miles or less from a wasteland or from a Superfund site. It's incredible that these peoples who started this country, who were here originally, are the ones now who have to bear the inequitable burden of living near chemicals that can harm them, can injure them, and can kill them. It, it was never anything else that, that beat us. It was poison that beat us. It was nothing else. I think else was going to beat us because of our way of life, because of our, our teachings from the past. We were going to be the future. But something came after us from Ford Motor Day. We couldn't be in that loop. They didn't do it in the night. They didn't do it in the night. They did it in the daytime. So right up to, again, right up to our our our, our, our they're, they're, they're all just as guilty. We're going to all. But we can't never give up. We can't never give up until the last one of us standing. And and a unity that we we start to over the decades acquire from from centuries ago is coming back in the circle. Is it the beginning of the pollution to the Monaco Reservoir? Is it the end? Is it midway? Not even the state and federal government really want to deal with this. My guess is because. They get the magnitude of what the state government, federal government, the governor's office, the senators, the president's office. I'm sure they're all aware of the possible, probable disaster that started over 50 some years ago. And it was sort of a little shocker that when they were reading it on the news that Ringwood wasn't mentioned, given that it's the only Superfund site ever to be delisted and relisted. And there was no mention. And again, I, I, I think it's, it was part of a design, not a mistake, because I think Ringwood is it's more than a hot potato, it's a poison potato. And then when they found the one for dioxin, which also is documents on state and federal documents, but the numbers were so high up in the Peters Mine area that it was unbelievable. Years later, you would get it at Ringwood State Park where thousands of people have fished over the years, thousands of children have fished over the years. And in a one acre reservoir, where you find it eight miles downstream. And basically the EPA is saying, well, somebody probably took a bottle of shampoo up in the area and dumped it in the water and that's what happened. This is what one of the top EPA people, the statement he made at a meeting that we were at. So, again, I think uh, the governor should be ashamed of himself in his office and the Highlands Council should be ashamed because it is in the Highlands region. And we weren't left out by mistake, it was by design because we're never going to get to the bottom of the poison because all government agencies aren't going to allow that because Ford Motor still calls the shots. Unfortunately, we will still continue to fight, we'll still continue to battle. But we need those even way above us to, to step up and stand our grounds and hold Ford Motor accountable. We can all agree, you can't save us. We can agree. But you can save the children of the future. You know, you can save the children downstream, you know, you, you can save unborn children that will be born into drink and poison water or, or a poison environment. But uh, until more and more towns, more and more places begin to say, you know what, we're part of it, they're our neighbors, or start figuring out, maybe it wasn't just them poison, you know, and getting after the government, holding them accountable for their failure and someone should be going after the governor and asking the question of you wrote this, but how is Ringwood not in it? How is Ringwood not part of it? You know, I need to be called out on this, you know?
and you know some of our Congress people need to be called out on it. While they're you know having a good day, talking on the news, they're all shaking hands and hugging and everything. And the people most affected back up in the area, there's no mention. But if we don't respect nature, nature not going to respect us. And let's face it, that's what's happening here. Is Um, but I hope that um, you, know, you all will get a chance to watch the full documentary. I'd be happy to um, share the share the link. So thank you all for uh, your attention today. Um, thanks, thanks, Anita. Um, some uh, lot, lot to think about there in terms of um, environmental justice, and, and just wondering, with um, I had a question was um, over um, a period of time. There's all the different um, legislation, federal laws, and policies, and um, quite often those have been to the detriment of the, the, the Native American people. I wondered. Um, and there's a little bit of commentary there at the end about um, how things, it, it seems still like a battle, but is, is, is the tide turning at all? Do you think, do you think that actually um, the federal policies and laws are changing or does that, is that dependent on the political climate and, and, and who's, who's in power? How, what, what's the, is, is, do you have a positive outlook for it or do you, do you think it's going to still be a, a massive battle going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would answer that question and say both. I do have a positive outlook on it, but it is still going to be a massive battle going forward. I think things have changed. I mean, you, you guys have probably heard about our, um, the, our political turmoil here of the last few years, and it was during um, this last administration from 26 to 2020 when a lot of environmental deregulations and rollbacks happened. So there is a more positive outlook on that. But as um, Wayne Mann mentions in, in this documentary here, sometimes it's despite the really positive um, pieces of legislation and the <laughs> progressive reforms that are happening legislatively, um, there's still a lot of work that has to be done on the ground. So Chief Mann has been in negotiation with the state of New Jersey for many years now to gain um, about a 100 acre site um, for um, doing some sustainable farming practices on and to lead a cultural restoration program on, but it's still gummed up. It's still not moving forward. So there's still a lot of work to be done um, with you know, advocacy work and things like that. Thank you, Anita. Um, it's just passed over to um, myself. I'm Rebecca. I haven't met you, but um, we would like to open a few questions to the floor, if you don't mind, um, for a few minutes. So if, um, with a powerful presentation like that, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, questions bubbling away. So please raise your hand and Mark will bring you a microphone so that Anita can hear you at the other end. No questions? Oh, one way at the back. Oh, it would be Dave. Yep. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the, the, the differences in the uh, Indian reservation land and how there's private ownership within it. Oh, okay. So, Anita, you may not have heard that, but um, the question was um, if you could explain the differences between um, of the Indian reservation land and the private ownership within it and how that came about. Well, it really came about through the, the series of laws that, I know, I know I went through those very, very quickly, um, but land was given as sovereign territory to certain Native nations, but um, there has definitely been a history of violating those treaty agreements, and, and allotment was part of that. So during allotment, you know, there was a... Um, um, let's say a 100,000 acre reservation, but only maybe, let's say, let me just exaggerate it here and say 20 people, 20 Native Americans from the tribe were living on it. 
Um, so rather than having the understanding of land as something that is like stewarded and that there's like hunting and land man management practices that are collective, the government decided like, okay, there's 20 people, they each get, you know, 40 acres or 100 acres and we end up with all this extra land. And that's where allotment came into play to divide that up and then it was sold to non-natives so that it could become you know, productive farmland and things like that. And so that that's the legacy that's still in place in um, you know, a number of reservations today. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? No, I think we've um, had given us a very powerful speech um, and in presentation, Anita, thank you. Um, we'd just like to say, Tēnē te mihi e ki a koe, Anita. Ko whaewa ki te whakawhiti e korero mō tēnē kaupapa hohonu. Akaua kaore ki koe te, i te mai ta tīnana ku tā kato nā korero tuku ihoi e pa ana ki oto ki tō mahi e ki tō pūkinga. Nā mātou te honore, nā mātou te maringa nui. Tēnē mihi, tēnē mihi, tēnē mihi, kia koe. Thank you. Thank you very much.